In vertebrate functional morphology, we often talk about the posture in legged locomotion in terms of how much of the foot is a foot as opposed to part of the leg. On the left, we have a plantigrade posture where the foot is properly a foot and the metatarsals contact the ground during the step. Moving to digitigrade, the metatarsals are raised from the ground and functionally form part of the leg, as in a dog or cat. Finally, in unguligrade, just the tips of the toes touch the ground and the whole foot extends the leg. As well as being a gradient from a relatively short to a longer leg, this also shows a sequence of mammalian evolution from a primitive condition to a highly derived and specialized condition for locomotion. For this reason, the prevailing perspective is that plantigrade, as seen not only in early mammals but in many modern reptiles, is a primitive and inefficient posture, whereas having erect and long limbs as seen in many modern mammals is an efficient posture. Now, the idea of long limbs being more economical does have a physical basis. One way to account for the work done in locomotion is to look at the velocity done just before and just after the transition to the next step. If we assume the transition between these velocities is impulsive, then it turns out that the work is proportional to the square of the angle between the velocity vectors. A consequence is that the cost of transport, or work per unit distance, is inversely proportional to the length squared. So if you reduce your leg length, your cost of transport will increase unless you shorten your step length drastically. What happens when you shorten your step length instead? Well, then you get very good cost savings. Consider this sequence where every time we have the step length in walking. The trajectory of the center of mass approaches a nearly flat line with the angle between the velocities being very small during each of these mini vaults. This is approaching something like a rolling wheel, which is very economical on flat ground. And if we do the math, we find that if we have the step length, we have the work done. But we also double the step frequency, which means we increase the work to swing the leg, and we also increase the activation cost from turning our muscles on and off. But now we will propose that we can achieve a sequence of mini vaults like what we just saw in a single step by using a plantigrade posture. Consider this leg and foot. What we will do is vault about each of these points in a sequence and then lock the associated joint. The net effect is to roll up the foot and to move along as if we were on a wheel. So we have achieved a nearly flat line motion with small transition angles in a single step. Here's an example of it working on a 3D printed object, which you can download yourself if you follow this link. The idea of a long foot rolling up like a wheel is not completely new. Many lizards have a very long foot in proportion to their leg. For example, the zebra tailed lizard has a very long fourth toe with five segments. Lee Say and Goldman found that the foot does indeed roll up during locomotion in the species, forming a circular arc. So feet might roll up in locomotion, but when is it better to be plantigrade? Let's play a game where we start with an inverted pendulum doing compass walking with a length L and step length D. We'll convert this to a plantigrade posture with the same total length, that is, the sum of the leg length and the foot length, and the same step length. We'll also vary the number of foot segments and see which posture costs the least amount of work. Here we have the compass gate on the top and below the plantigrade case, here with just one foot segment. These little lines show the mini vaults for clarity. Watch what happens first as we change the step length we'll see the proportion of the foot and the leg length change in the plantigrade case. The proportions have to change to maintain the same step length. We can also see the work changing as the step length varies. When the step length is small, plantigrade is actually cheaper. But when the step length gets big, the no foot condition becomes cheaper. So there is a point where both conditions cost equal amounts of work. Now watch what happens when we increase the number of segments. Increasing the number of segments always decreases the amount of work we do for a given step length because we increase the number of mini vaults per step. Hopefully that gives you a visual of the kind of game we're playing. Now let's look at the overall results. Here we have work per step 
as a function of step length normalized to leg length. The compass gate condition is shown as this blue line, and then we have different plantigrade conditions increasing the number of foot segments from 1 to 6. You can see that each plantigrade condition intersects with the compass gate condition. Below that intersection point at lower step lengths, plantigrade wins, and above that point, a compass gate wins. You can also see that at any given step length below the intersection, increasing the number of segments reduces the amount of work done. Finally, let's look at a slice at constant work per step. What do these configurations look like? Here they are going from a short leg length with a long foot to a shorter foot and finally no foot. This looks a bit like the plantigrade, digitigrade, and ungulagrade conditions we saw before, but all of these conditions have equal cost. This challenges the classical perspective that plantigrade means less efficient. In fact, each of these configurations could be just as economical, but with different strategies. So far, we've talked about 2D locomotion, but lizards sprawl, meaning that their feet stick out to the side when walking and running. Does the strategy still work? Yes, but instead of using a wheel, we use a sphere. Here's an example of a lizard foot, which is a cap of a sphere centered at the knee. You can see that it rolls along quite nicely. From the side, the hip, where my fingers are, follows a straight line. Whereas from the top, you can see that the knee first goes out to the side and then back in. Here's that sideways motion shown more explicitly, viewed from above at different time steps. As the hip moves forward, the knee traces out this curved path. If the center of pressure remains always below the knee, then all we need to do is make a foot that follows this path where the toes roll up in much the same way as before. Here's how that might look. You can see that the knee stays right above the foot as I fold this up. If we see it from the side, we can also see that it maintains a relatively flat path vertically. Going back to our lizard, we can see that the knee follows that fourth toe quite nicely. So watch it very carefully. We're looking for the position of the knee and as it follows the curvature of this fourth toe. You can see that that knee goes almost right over that fourth toe as this lizard moves around. You can also see that the fourth toe in stance is forming a curving path like we might expect. So if you remember anything from my talk, I want you to remember that plantigrade can reduce work compared to compass walking. This is most effective at lower step lengths and most effective with more foot segments. We can use the same trick with sprawling posture using curved toes that effectively form the surface of a sphere. This challenges the classical picture and shows that erect posture is not necessarily more economical than plantigrade. I hope you've enjoyed this talk and I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me either at this email, you can find me on my website, or on my social channels.